to come and uh, just speak about this subject, which is actually very important uh, and very frightening when it comes up to exams, because I don't know about you, but uh, when I was doing my exams, this was the area that I was least familiar with in terms of all the maths and science behind it, because it's so far away, it seems, at first sight, from what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a big subject. In your books, I've put about 50 slides. Uh, I could speak for an hour about all of this, but I've cut it down to what I think are the 10 most important parts, and I've put them in 10 slides. So hopefully this will be like a mini presentation of the biomechanics of fractal fixation. I'd really like to try and understand how the material type that we use and also the shape that we put it in will affect the biomechanics at the fracture site. And also, I want to try and uh, pass on to you this idea of what the working length is and how working length will affect fracture healing for us. We've mentioned a little bit about Perrin's strain theory, but I want to emphasize how we can use that to our advantage in different situations. And also, I want to look at a few uh, specific types of fixation that we might use from external to internal fixation and how we can use biomechanical principles to optimize stability using those constructs. So first off, I'd like to talk to you about the measure of stiffness and implant materials. So stiffness, as you can see, is coming from the stress-strain graph in the elastic portion of the stress-strain graph. And we can see all these different materials here, and I've highlighted cortical bone there. And the closer a material gets in its stiffness, the cortical bone, the more load sharing it will be. If it's much stiffer than cortical bone, then it will be more load bearing. Okay? And what we, we want to use those two different uh, things to our advantage if possible. And in general, we try to use materials that are more flexible and will be more load sharing with the bone in order to encourage the bone healing. But there are some situations where you can't share with the bone, for instance, in bone loss or in very fragmented fractures, where you may select a, a material that is more uh, load bearing. You see different implant companies have gone from stainless steel to titanium, and now many of them are going back to stainless steel. And, and they're doing this because of the different things that they've experienced. So some one of the disadvantages to titanium is that it's, uh, it can fracture. They were using quite thin plates. Many of them ended up fracturing. I'll come on to working length in a minute because so many of these principles are important to understanding why our implants fail uh, and why fractures don't heal or how we can use them to our advantage. But when we think about which material to use, we think about stiffness, and stiffness is important because it will guide us towards whether we're using it as a load-sharing or a load-bearing implant. The second thing that we can think about our implant is the shape of the implant. If you look at that graph on the right-hand side, you can see exactly the same material, and we're looking at a similar stress-strain graph to the one that we saw on the previous slide, but what we can see here is that we've increased the radius of the implant, and that way we've really changed the way that it behaves on the stress-strain graph. And so by changing the shape of an implant, we can affect what we call its bending rigidity. And the bending rigidity is really uh, it what we're trying to achieve in a fracture is to stop the fracture moving. And in particular, that's true for things like intramedullary nails. And you can see that there's a close relationship between the radius of an implant and its bending rigidity, and that's to the power of three. Does anyone know if we had a solid cylinder, what that would be to the power of? Four, in fact, so it goes up to the power of four. So for a plate, where it's a rectangular structure, it's to the power of three to the thickness of the plate. And then for a uh, hollow, which is mainly what we use for intramedullary nails because they're normally cannulated, is to the power of three. But if you do have a solid nail, it's very resistant to bending, and it'll be to the power of four on the radius. So the next concept I want to introduce to you is this idea of the working length. I always found it very difficult to understand that. People were talking about the working length like it was really important, and I didn't really know what it was about. But it's important, as Vikas and others have said, that stress is transferred into uh, the plate when a load is placed upon it. And that stress can be concentrated in a short area of the plate, or it can be spread over a longer area of the plate. And so the working length is really that area about which the stress is distributed in the plate, 
and it's defined as the distance between, between the two screws nearest to the fracture site, if that makes sense. So on a plate, we often put screws quite near a fracture site, so we have a short working length. If you compare that to an intramedullary nail, it will have a long working length. So sometimes if we see, uh, see a plate on a femur with a very short working length used as a compression plate, we often find those plates fracture because there's such a lot of stress that it builds up uh, a fatigue within the metalware and it ends up causing a fracture very unlikely to fracture an intramedullary nail by that mechanism. The other important thing about sh uh, working length is to understand its effect on stiffness. So the shorter the working length, the stiffer the construct. And this is important when it comes to using plates, say, as bridging plates, where we are trying to get secondary bone healing by callus. We don't really want a super stiff construct. We want to increase our working length and increase um, the micromotion at the site. So I hope I've explained a little bit about working length, but it has this effect on stress in the plate, which will lead to implant uh, failure, but it also has this effect on the rigidity of the construct. If we can increase the working length, it will increase micromotion and will give us better chance of healing by um, callus formation. We've heard a little bit about this, so I won't go over the strain again uh, in terms of parent strain theory. We know about that. Just to mention that strain is the change in length over the original length. It has no units, so often measured as a percentage. Now, this is the interesting thing about strain. Let's see if I can get my thing to work. Can you see, this is from Perrin's original paper in the, in, in the JBJS in 2002. And he showed that uh, if you had a five millimeter gap in your fracture site, and uh, you applied a load such that you stretched it another five millimeters, you would have five over five, uh, the change in length of the original length would give you a strain of 100%. Definitely not going to lead to fracture healing, right? But what he showed is that actually, and this is an important concept to understand, if you had a multi-fragmentary fracture with many fracture lines within there, and you put the same load and distracted it by five millimeters, that each one of those fracture sites would take up one millimeter because it would be equally distributed. And then the change, which would be six, five plus one over five would only be 20% in each fracture site. Now, that's exaggerated. We definitely wouldn't want a 20% strain because we're looking for less than 2%, right? But what he's showing is that a fracture gap and a long working length in a multi-fragmentary fracture can lead to fracture healing. If you use a long working length and you have one fracture line, then you can get too much movement because it's not dissipated amongst many fracture lines. And that's one of the most common causes we see of non-union is using locking plates with a long working length and a single fracture line. So it's understanding Perrin's strain theory and understanding that those, that type of technique using locking plates as a bridging plate, say on a, on a diaphyseal fracture, is best used when you have multiple fracture lines to dissipate the, uh, str the strain in. So just a few specific things that come up in exams about uh, different types of fixation that we might use and the biomechanics of them. They love to ask about the stability.